All right. And um, Miss Sam, can I bother you for a prayer? Sure. I can hear you. You should turn up your volume. Okay. okay. All right. Sure, Miss Natalie. Uh, yeah, everybody, bow our heads, please. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you once again, thanking you and praising you for just another day's journey, oh God. Right now, God, as we uh, explore new heights with our Black historian, Lee Robinson, God, open our hearts and our minds to be receptive, oh God. Let us be good listeners and have good questions for Mr. Lee, God. We love you, Lord, and we need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Okay, I guess with that, this is turned over to me. So how are everybody doing tonight? Wonderful. That's good. Good, yeah, well, good. Tonight, we're going to discuss the African-Americans of the, the Gilded Age. Okay, now, a lot of you probably are wondering exactly what the Gilded Age is and what it used to be. So first, let me give you a quick synopsis of what I'm talking about when I say the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age was a time of rapid growth, especially in the Northern and Western United States, as American wages grew much higher than those in Europe, especially for skilled workers. And industrialization demanded increasingly skilled labor force. Now, this took place, it began in the 1870s, and it ran until the 1900s. So there was a, this was a time after African American was freed from slavery. Now, a period of immigration influx came to this country by millions, European immigrants. The rapid expansion of industrialization led to a real wage growth to 40% from 1860 to 1890 and spread across an increasing labor force. The average annual wage per industrial worker, including men, women, and children, rose from $380 a year. Now think of that, $380 a year. But $380 a year in today's dollars would be $11,998 to it rose to $584 in 1890. So that was a substantial raise for those people. Mm -hmm. It was a gain of 59%. Now, the Gilded Age was also an era of poverty, especially in the South, and growing inequality as millions of immigrants poured in and millions of, or hundreds of thousands, and millions of African Americans left the South seeking better lives up North. Now, that's also was the era that Jim Crow was invented. So we all know about Jim Crow because we've talked about that many times. Now, we want to get to the black elites of the Gilded Age. Because with all that newfound industrialization, the great industrial America and the world actually, it also gave rise to a bunch of African Americans who was doing quite well at a time when most people would assume that African Americans doing bad. In the past, all African Americans were portrayed in the media, both black and white, as downtrodden, poor, and always needing a helping hand. However, little has been published or even discussed until recently about the black elite, the movers and the shakers who defied racist stereotypes. Just a few years after the end of slavery, the Gilded Age came in from 1870 to 1900. It ushered in a black aristocracy made up of black Americans who managed to amass wealth and education they had previously <clears throat> been denied due to being slaves. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, 
we've all read about and learned about the Industrial Revolution when we was in school. But the Industrial Revolution and the railroad boom opened business opportunities across the US. Many black elite were made up of shopkeepers and inventors. You know, you always hear about the black inventors and they always seem to be people who lived in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Well, these black people ran and owned shops and invented new things that they sold for a profit, which generated a lot of wealth for them. The Gilded Age was a period toward the end of the 19th century, marked by rapid economic growth and prosperity. And many of the black elite during that time owned retail stores, grocery stores, pharmacies, worked in the medicine and as educational profession, professionals. After the Civil War, there was an incredible explosion of modern industry, technology, and science, which fueled the money that made the Gilded Age the explosion that created the wealth of the Black elites. Now, many African Americans are of the belief that Black people only lived in the South on plantation during and after the Civil War. But nothing could be further from the truth. America's biggest cities, the largest cities in this country, populations grew large, and the Black population grew by leaps and bounds after the Civil War. And that is mainly where the Black elites thrive. They thrive in the big cities of this country. <clears throat> the main cities was New York City, Boston, St. Louis, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and there were several others. There were men like Thomas Downey, son of a formerly, former slave parents, who moved to New York and became a savvy businessman who popularized oysters. Oysters had been considered just a low common food, but in 1825, he opened the upscale Thomas Downey Oyster House, a restaurant so popular that Downing was nicknamed the New York Oyster King. Now just look at the time period. He got started even before the Gilded Age started in 1825, while other Blacks was enslaved in the other areas in 1825. This guy was making big money in New York City. Downing was one of the wealthiest people in New York City at the time of his death in 1866. Even though he was prohibited from acquiring US citizenship until the Civil Rights Act of 1866 was passed, just one day before he died. Because now you have to remember that black people were not really officially citizens of the United States until they passed the 14th, 13th, 14th Amendments. And the 14th Amendment didn't really get passed until 1866. So Mr. Downing, he made, made it by just one day before he passed away. Now, Thomas Downing's had a son, George Downing. He followed his father's footsteps and built a resort hotel, the Sea Grit House in Newport, Rhode Island. That was a millionaire black man that I'm talking about. And his son, Thomas Downing, continued with the wealth and continued to be a millionaire. There was also Pierre Toussaint, who was born a slave in Haiti and was eventually freed in New York City. He became a highly sought after hairdresser. <laughs> I think about a hairdresser among the society's upper crust and used his new wealth to support orphans and immigrants, gain education and employment. Black women also gained financial and social power. Mary Ellen Pleasant became a self-made millionaire after she moved to San Francisco following the glimmer of the California gold rush. You know, you've seen a lot about the gold rush, but they never show you the black people who was there trying to get gold and get Shut money up. from the people who did get gold. While she worked as a domestic help, she listened to the wealthy men she served as they exchanged information on making proper investments and managing money. This sister sit there and she heard all the things they said about how to make money. Well, 
she used that knowledge that she heard these white guys talk about to buy up boarding houses, laundromats, restaurants, and Wells Fargo shares. And she became a very famous rich figure in San Francisco. Now, the elites, the black elites of this time period, education was a major factor. Money alone didn't grant access to the upper echelons of black society. In addition to having character and respectability, the black elites emphasized both education and hard work as core values, according to a historian, Carla Peterson. From the end of slavery, education has always been the number one thing stressed in the black community. Now, as each one of us know, and every black person over 50 knows, or should know that there used to be a belief that if you had ambition and an education, you could do almost anything you wanted to do. Too bad that it seems like that's not being taught to the youngsters today. On February 25th, 1837, a Quaker philanthropist named Richard Humphreys opened up the very first HBCU school in the country. The African American Institute now is Cheney University in Pennsylvania. The majority of HBCUs originated from 1865 to 1900, the period following the Emancipation Proclamation. Education was the key to unlocking the skills to become a doctor or pharmacist or any professional career that led to a flourishing good way of life. And people like W.E.B. Du Bois advocated for the need for an educated class. Now, he had a couple of arguments with Booker T. Washington about, you know, during that time, who should be the ones to get educated. It was called, uh, he decided that the talented 10th, the 10th percent of black people, only 10 percent of black people should get the education and train the others. Well, Booker T. Washington didn't believe that. He wasn't against black people getting education. Nothing was farther from the truth. He wanted them to get education, but he also believed that black people need to learn a trade, how to become blue collar workers, because that's what they had been used to as slaves. And that once they learn a skill and a trade that they can earn money from, then education will come along. But anyway, these two guys are all good. And actually, the black elite became part of both. Some of the talented 10th and some of the blue collar workers, and they all did pretty well. He, he was like, now he had a quote, the Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by his exceptional men. He believed in the talented 10th. He was also an elite black person from an elite family. And another thing that quite as is kept, most of these elite black people were mixed race, just like W.E.B. Dubois. He calls himself Dubois, but his grandfather was actually named, I mean, Dubois. His, his, his grandfather was actually named Dubois. He called himself Dubois to try to make it sound more American. But he, you know, and well, I just continue. Don't get me wrong, because not everyone Black had wealth during the Gilded Age. The Gilded Age was also notorious for having the rich elites on one corner and the very poor on the other corner. Most workers, especially uneducated Black Americans and European immigrants, faced extreme poverty and harsh working conditions in Northern factories. Even those who did manage to gain wealth faced pervasive systemic inequities. White society largely viewed Black Americans as a homogeneous mass of degraded people. According to Willard B. Gatewood in his book, Atrocities and Aristocrats of Color, The Black Elite, even exceptional Blacks were considered inferior to whites, he wrote. There was another fact that has been kept quiet in our, in our history, and I think I just mentioned this, but I'll, I'll mention it again. 
The fact that many of the black elites were a mixed race and some even passed for white for most of their lives. This fact caused a certain amount of cooperation and interracial alliances between blacks and whites. Professional relationships enable black Americans to climb the ranks within business. Because you know, in that early period of our history from the 1870s to the early 1900s, it was almost impossible to get anywhere as a black man without having some type of relationship with somebody white. You had to be friends with somebody white who liked you, who respected you, who wanted to help you. Because if you was just down for the brothers, uh, you probably was never gonna get anywhere. So you had to use your intelligence. So if you had white ancestors, you had to let it be known to some of these white people so they can help you. And that's exactly what happened. Historians believe if not for the black elite and their ties to the political and social activism in the 20th century, the NAAC would not have been founded in 1909 or the Harlem Renaissance would never have happened. None of this could have happened without having had the 19th century black elite. Many of the things that we enjoy many of the rules that help African Americans get to where we are today was because of those black elite rich people living in those areas. Madam C.J. Walker was, a, was one of the black elites. Uh, there were plenty of people who you have heard about, you have, have read about, you know about. They were part of the, the black elites of the Gilders age. Now, Where did the black elites live in St. Louis? And can, can anybody, anybody, just give me a good answer. Anybody, where did the black elites live in St. Louis? In the Ville. Bingo, she wins a cigar. <laughs> 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 yep, the black elites in the mid 1880s, 1800s, the Ville was a semi-rural suburb of St. Louis known as Ellertsville which later became part of the city of St. Louis. In the early 1900s, the Ville became one of the few areas of St. Louis where African-Americans could own property. And by the 1920s and 30s, the Ville had become the cradle of culture for black St. Louis. The Ville not only attracted major black figures in a number of fields, but produced a disproportionate number of individuals who went on to receive worldwide recognition. Dr. Martin Luther King, Drive, originally Eastern Avenue, served as the main commercial street in the neighborhood, and a number of Black institutions were established in the neighborhood, many of which are still functioning today. Due to the long period of development, the Ville, a wide variety of agricultural styles and building types can be found. The Ville was designated as a local historic district in 1987 and was expanded in 2006. Now, the Ville, the good thing about the Ville is the rich black elites lived next door to the middle class. And the middle class lived next door to the ones who was lower middle class because there was a time of segregation. So black people had to all live in the same community, even though you may have been rich, you probably lived on the street where the, where the will to do lived. And the middle class may have lived on another street where the middle class lived. And the lower middle class lived on another street. However, all of those neighborhoods, all those streets was, was within the Ville. And what a sad note is, we was pushing so hard for integration. As soon as the laws pass for integration, businesses, the black hotels, the black restaurants, and the black professionals began to move out of the Ville, rich and middle class, leaving the lower middle class. And so the Ville became what it is today because the well-to-do educated intelligentsia moved away. And that, had, that happened to most of your big neighborhoods. That happened in Harlem, New York. That happened on the south side of Chicago. That, that happened 
almost in Prince George's County in, in Washington, D.C., but that neighborhood is still pretty much intact. That was a neighborhood in Washington, D.C. where the Black elites lived in Prince George's County. And these people are very rich. And there were rich people that lived on the south side of Chicago as well. And the Harlem, believe it or not, that is where a whole bunch of rich Black people lived until Harlem began to go through that change that all Black neighborhoods seemed to go through. Now, we're going to talk about Harlem a little bit more in my in our very next uh, historical lesson. Now, these are some of the people who you knew about who were Black elites during the Gilded Age. You ever heard of Garrett Morgan? He was part of the Black elite who blazed a trail for black inventors with his patents, including those for an improved traffic light and a breathing device that preceded World War I, which became known as the gas mask. You heard of Louis Latimer. He was an inventor and draftsman best known for his contributions to the patenting of the light bulb. And he used to work with Thomas Edison. He was on the Edison team. We spoke of W.E.B. Du Bois. And we know he had founded the NAACP. He was also the first African-American to earn a PhD from Harvard University in 1895. And he did a lot of other things. And Carter G. Woodson, the very man who started Negro History Week, which we have turned into Black History Month. Carter G. Woodson was an American writer and historian known as the father of Black history. He penned the influential book, The Miseducation of the Negro. And one day, if you guys can read that book, that is a very good book. And I've mentioned him before, Booker T. Washington was one of the main African-American leaders of the late 19th and 20th centuries following the Tuskegee, I'm, I'm sorry, he found the Tuskegee University. He found that university. Now, I have a couple of books I know you guys might not have pen and paper, but these books uh, will help you learn a little bit more about the Black elites of the Gilded Age. One book is called All Kind of People by Graham Lawrence. That book describes how the Black elites belong to all of these fancy, you know, he's that, you know, I know you guys have heard of cotillions and and balls and most of your most of your fraternities were all part of that uh black elite group. But our kind of people tells the story of African Americans who are mixed race, who are trying to live as white people and it tells you exactly how you could how they used to go about trying to do it it also tells you how the ones who had lots of money black people with lots of money they tried to not associate with black people who didn't have any money and so they call them he he titled his book all kind of people it's a good book it's a good read the other book is The Original Black Elite by Daniel Murray. And he talks about many of the same things I'm talking about, except he gets more in depth because he wrote an entire book about it, The Original Black Elite. And then there's another book called The Black Bourgeoisies, or The Bourgeois, The Black Bourgeois by E. Franklin Fraser. He talk about all these upper crust millionaire black people as well. And when you read those books, you'll find that Black people have been having wealth in this country a long time. It wasn't every, you know, it, it wasn't millions of black people who were millionaires, but there are quite a few who never had to worry about anything other than dealing with the racism of the country and the inequities that they had to face, but they were still able to make money. They were still able to do the things that they need to do for their families. You know, most of your black politicians, the very first black politician, the very first ones that were allowed to become uh, senators and congressmen, uh, 
those people were from the black elite. And most of those people were mixed race as well. It's, 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 it's just the way it was. They have a, I think there's an HBO special, HBO series that's called Blacks of the Gilded Age, I think. I'm not certain. I think I read, ran across it. I haven't seen, I haven't watched it. But money, prosperity, because of the Industrial Revolution, gave these Black people the opportunity to make funds, work on the railroad, work for the railroad, to get involved in the industrialization, to uh, earn money, to open your own shops and your own stores, grocery stores and what have you. They also pushed education. Education was the key because you had some of the most educated Black people. You know, it was a time when the first Black person would go to Harvard or the first Black person would go to Yale because there wasn't a lot of Black people being allowed into those institutions. But these elite people were. And I know I didn't come from anybody elite, but I look at myself, I probably would have been an elite if I was back in that day. <laughs> uh, that's any questions. I, 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 I got a lot of answers if you guys got a lot of questions. Hey, everyone, I had taken uh, videos down when Mr. Robinson was speaking, but now that we're at the question and answer part, please feel free to turn your videos back on as well. I really couldn't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Corey has a question. Say it again. Thank you, Sister, Thank you, Sister Portis. Uh, daughter, I don't know. I can't get my camera up today for some reason. I don't know. And Brother Robinson, with all due respect, I'm listening to you. I had a question for you. Um, and there's some lines of you're talking about Booker T. Washington and, and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who were great men during their time period. But what's so ironic about us as a race of people, we have this mentality as either or, as for example, for clarity, you know, some people embrace Booker T. Washington. He was agrarian. He, you know, he did things with his hands, of course, opened the school and things of that nature, whereas W.B. Du Bois was an intellectual. And, and sometimes what bothers me is that we have to pick. We had W.B. Du Bois or Booker T. Washington, Dr. King or Malcolm X. And sometimes as Black people, I don't understand why we can't just take what we can from each particular person and they don't have to be just alike. I mean, the diversity is good. I could appreciate both of their perspectives. Of course, you know, W.B. Du Bois was from a, a, an affluent family. And obviously, from looking at him, you could tell he wasn't too far away from, you know, having a white ancestor. So that's probably one of the reasons also that he was allowed into Harvard. And did you mention, or you may have, I was trying to get this camera fixed, that oh, he yeah. was the first PhD yeah, yeah. from Harvard. Did you, did you mention that? Yeah, I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned that he had, he had a white grandfather. Yes, I mentioned okay. that. Okay. And wasn't he the first PhD from Harvard as well? That first black one, yes. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. And I know you wrote The Souls of Black Folks, but I look at, as I read and I research and I study those two individuals, both were great men in their own right. They had different experiences, um, different upbringings, different access, and therefore, you know, they had a different perspective. But I think that there was value in both of their perspectives. You know, we can take a little bit from this and a little bit from that and then kind of merge those, you know, together as opposed to always being so divisive. As I look at this uh, history in the making with Kamala Harris, I've been praying, saying, Lord, please let this work. Please, you know, uh, embrace her. But I'm hoping that there's not a divisiveness that will develop again just from her running. And, um, you know, I don't foresee anybody that's, you know, really it will be some divisiveness in terms of her running. And, and will she get a lot of pushback from some prop or just some pushback from some very prominent black folk who may access. Well, well, you know, uh you're right. Everything you said is 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 spot on. And and there were groups of people who subscribed to both W. E. B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington's philosophies. 
because that's how we that's how we end up getting to where we are today. Uh, you know, Booker T. Washington found the Tuskegee University. To be honest about you, to be honest with, with you, even though uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was an important man and he was a, 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 a intellectual, Booker T. Washington actually did more tangible things for the African American people than W.E.B. Du Bois because W.E.B. Du Bois did center his thought on just the intelligentsia, the educated ones, the ones, you know, who could become the movers and the shakers and, and challenge white folks for political positions. But at that time period, at that time period, you and I both know the best thing he did was come up with the NAACP because the NAACP became an organization to fight for justice for black people. And that was the best thing he did. And he, he did that along with a lot of other white people. Like I was saying earlier, if you didn't hear me, the, these guys had to get white people on their side. But the difference with Booker T. Washington, he got the president of the United States on his side to help create things for black people. He had an open door policy that he could go to the president and talk to him about all sorts of things. So, and, and that he was like an unofficial black cabinet me, uh, member of the president. So you are right. They, they did have adversarial type ideas and there were people on both sides bickering about it. And, uh, but eventually they did come together. Now on your question with Kamala Harris, the only the only thing I because I've been I've been reading I probably sh shouldn't read it but I've been reading uh, on the internet different you know uh, posts from different black people. Thing that will that that I see, naturally white people are gonna have a problem with her, but there are a lot of African Americans who see her as she wants black people to, to, to fall in line behind her. She wants black people to respect her. But when, this is what I've heard, when she decided to get married, she didn't decide to respect black men. She decided to respect white men. And so there are gonna be a lot of black men who just gonna just say, nope, let them elect you. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, she wasn't, she didn't, she really wasn't that interested in black people according to these people until she started running for politics. But anyway, who knows? She may win. Any other questions? Can I just make one, one further point um, yes. regarding that? And I, I hear you and feel you on that. Um, the only thing, and I thought that, you know, uh, W. E. Du Bois was a, a, a brilliant man, but he also had a concept, and I don't know if it was in the Souls of Black Folks, one of the books of his I've read. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. But he <laughs> talked about the talented tenth concept. Yes. And while I, you know, and, and and that in and of itself can be divisive, and and the premise basically was that you need the top, the elite, the intellectuals to lead yes. everybody else. And just right. because someone doesn't have a, a degree from Harvard doesn't mean that they're not intelligent. And sometimes we, we confuse that because we equate intelligence with a formal education as opposed to just intelligence. It doesn't have to be book intelligence. You can be intelligent in so many other aspects of your life. So that talented 10th concept um, was kind of like an exclusive group, group of people, if I may, you know? And so I can understand how some people during that era may not have been able to relate to him because he was a, an intellectual and a Harvard grad and all the other things that go along with his accolades. But I think that that's, that's divisive to a certain degree because of the implication again, um, is that you have to be an educated person in order to be able to lead a people. And that's not necessarily the case. We can look at Brother Malcolm X. Of course, he got his, his education in jail, but a brilliant but that, no, man. But and it didn't just, come from... 
What you were just they came from the school of what you were just what you just, and, and the life that he lived. But what you just articulated I, is exactly I think you can is find exactly, anybody as brilliant. Is, ex is exactly the argument that Booger T. Washington was giving W. E. B. Du Bois. That's mm -hmm. that was his that was his philosophy that you you're equating the rest of the ninety percent of black people as being ignorant. You only want the talented tent, and that was their main argument. You know, they both had different ways to, to for Black people to become successful in the country, but their main argument was exactly what you're talking about, that 10% of smart people should run that Black community. And, and w, uh, Booker T. Washington was totally against that. Now, both of these guys were elite Blacks, but Booker T. Washington came up from the school of hard knocks. He didn't come through no elite family. You know, he was totally self-made man. And that's why you couldn't, you, you really couldn't just tell him too much what to do. He just did what he wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was a little different than, you know, a guy that, you know, been raised with a silver spoon in his mouth. And and then and then that's that's kept quiet. But WB, WB the boys was raised in a well-to-do family Amen. in the 1800s. Amen. Okay, anybody like else? <clears throat> Any other questions, comments you want to make? Hey, I know I came in late, but I, um, and I only heard like the, the back part of the story, but I like Booker T. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of us like Booker T. <laughs> Booker T did a lot. You and I mean, there's a whole university in in, in uh, Alabama that Booker T founded and thousands of black kids go to every year. Booker uh, W. E. B. Du Bois, there's no university that he founded. So they both was educated type men in their own way. That's a good thing. Yes, it was. I this was my first time hearing about uh, the vice president lady. I didn't know she had a, a, a husband that was white or black. I was wondering about that, and I and I was thinking about that when you said it. I was like. All these black men out here, and you pick a white, you know, but you know that's I don't know if that says volumes or not, because I hear so many things when they talk about black men, and they talk about black men, and they talk about the money, you know, that certain black men don't have, and. Yeah women try to go with the man that has the money and most of the men that got the money are the white men. Yeah, you know I mean? you're right. Well, well, as you know, I, this, I, I didn't really want to get so much on, on Kamala Harris, but you know, uh, she's going to get, she's going to get the votes that she's going to get the same votes that Biden was going to get. She's going to get the Democrat vote. She's going to get the black people vote. She's going to get, the, the 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 votes that was going to go to to Biden, she's going to get the same thing. But is is you know, you you know, you, before you, I've come to the conclusion in my life that I'm not going to vote for a black person just because they're black. They're going to have to prove to me that they are capable and able to do the things that we need done in our community. Because you know, our community suffers greatly regardless of who the president is. And right. you can have the black president, the white president, the Chinese president, if you want, until they start changing our community, fixing our education system, causing us not, our people not to be in dire straits, then it doesn't really matter. And, and most of them don't do much of that. Most of them just give us a lot of lip service, but this ain't a political thing. So I'm, I'm gonna get back to these elite black people. You know, <laughs> I know, uh, 
Rosalind got some elite black folks in her family. She know it. She knows. She knows she does. Don't you, Rosalind? <laughs> you got some elite, some elite black people in your family. I know some yeah. people that got. I just yeah. don't know them. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but no, it's it's just the reason I picked this subject is because <laughs> I want African Americans to realize that we as a people have accomplished more than just being slaves coming out the cotton fields and and living in the ghetto. Okay, in the civil rights movement. You before all of that occurred, you had well to do African Americans who live well who, you know, they did a lot of great things. And if, it, and if it wasn't for those elite black people of the late 1800s and early 1900s, we would not be where we are today. As a matter of fact, let me give you a quick, a quick preview of our next subject matter. Our next subject matter is going to be the Harlem Renaissance. I know you guys have heard, all you educated people have heard of the Harlem Renaissance. Well, if it wasn't for those black elites of the Gilded Age, there would never have been a Harlem Renaissance. So that's a whole different that's a whole different story, because this is a this is a this is a different generation, but they were inspired by the elite blacks. Most of the people who are involved in the Harlem Renaissance parents and grandparents were the people of the Gilded Age. So we're gonna get on that next time. And you will find out a lot about Harlem that you did not know. It's, it's not like it, you know, now is it's considered just a, uh, it's considered the North side of New York, like the North side of St. Louis. But mm -hmm. it's, it wasn't like that years ago. Uh -huh. So. So if, any, if there's no more questions, you know, I know this is not something everybody want to uh, do a bunch of questions about, but it's important that you know all aspects of our history. You know, that way, you know, from the beginning to the end, you know, from A to Z, you don't leave Let nothing. Let me put up. a little bit in also, Ron. Say again. Can I put a little bit in also? Yes, run your mouth, brother, man. <laughs> okay. First off, man, I want to thank you again for, for this particular program you got going because it uh, helps us all out and help us move a train of thought. Uh, but when we listen to people around the world, they will tell us to the person that we are our worst enemies. A Chinese can come here to America and find a job with another Chinese. They will put together and do their banking. History has told us uh, with the uh, uh, Black Wall Street, that's what they fear from us and don't want us to uh, support one another. Don't want us to encourage each other to go to school. Don't want to encourage us to uh, participate in our brothers and sisters. And even if we don't get along with the person, if they have a black business and if it's a viable black business, we should support it. And that's where we fall down as a people and not understanding our place in the world picture, not just in our neighborhood, we have to look broader than our world picture. I mean, our neighborhood and look at the world picture. How do we get to the table? And like they were saying, if you don't bring any money, don't come to the table. How do we get the table? We start with our families, start teaching our kids, like you said earlier, Ron, uh, I mean, uh, Lee, is to uh, start with education. Not everybody is going to be a professor. Give that person uh, the encouragement to be a good tradesman. You can go all over the country as a plumber and be a plumber. No yeah, matter you, who you are. You know, so when you started out, you, with the way you started out with your scenario of how, uh -huh. the, Chinese, how the Chinese can come here and and rely on the, the other Chinese to get them out 
in Chinatown. And it's not, it's not so much, there's, it's a reason for that. Uh, it's a reason for that. And it, the reason is African-Americans have been pitted against each other so much until they, we, our people are not teaching each other. It's not so much somebody is telling us not to do this. We're doing this to ourselves. We yeah. are not uh, just trying to help the other black man that needs help because that's not something that you, it's not in the, it's not in the African-American culture. It's in the African culture with Africans, but see, you, you lost all of that when you came here. You lost all the Africanness. We black, but we are not Africans. We, we, we call ourselves African-American because of the ancestors and all that stuff. But we, we don't think like Africans. You think like white men. And the Irish had the same problem. The English wouldn't help the Irish. The Italians had the same problem. The English wouldn't help the Italians. But the Italians helped each other and the Irish helped each other, and the Russians helped each other. But we didn't do that because we had been raised in slavery. Our ancestors, you think of this, you think of this. My grandmother and my grandfather were slaves, okay? So what do you think they was teaching my mom and my father when they was growing up. You know, they was freed before they had kids or even got married or anything. But by the time my grandmother and grandfather got old enough to have children, they was free from slavery. But what could they teach those kids in Mississippi when one's been a field hand and the other been a domestic worker in the house? What, can they, what, what could they teach them? Nothing. They had no education. They couldn't read. They couldn't write. So they taught their kids just how to live every day and how to pray to God and how to act and how to behave. And then they had, in turn, had to teach their kids. My mother taught me what she knew. My mother had a third grade education. My father passed away when I was six years old. He had eighth grade education. And so... I had to learn things on my own. And that's what we have to do. We have to, the ones who are capable, able, need to teach young black people to get an education, not just at the PhD level, not just at the university, but at the at the trade school. You mm -hmm. know, go to trade school. If you, if you can't do anything else, go to trade school. But I, but I understand what you're saying. You are so uh, right. You are so right, Lee. Yeah. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. That's what I did. Yeah. yeah and, well, a lot you know, of, and a lot of us do have done. A lot of us did. You know what? You know what? Uh, I went to college and I went to trade school. I did both of them. I graduated from both places. I got a bachelor's degree and I got a, a journeyman certificate as an electrician. I did them both because I had to raise a family. So if one thing didn't work out, the other thing would, yeah. you know, so that's, and, and, and that's just what you have to do. And, and yeah. these young black men will have to learn to do that as well. And, and trade schools are no longer a last choice because trade schools, I mean, they require good math and science skills, and they also, uh, pay very lucratively. Now, you know, they, we know that they pay much more than some of the uh, four-year degrees pay starting out. So they are, uh, you know, not looked at anymore as a last choice or because you can't get through college. You know, yeah. they are the positions that you can be difficult to enter and difficult to maintain. And if you are able to, you come out with a very lucrative salary. Exactly okay. right. Exactly right, and 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 uh, I have to I have to say that to push back on you on this, Donald. The math was always hard at the trade school. 
<laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Oh yeah. And you have to you have to know that before you can even get in to learn the trade. That's right. So so that is what parents need to push for their kids. Everybody can't go to the university. And so the ones that cannot go to the university, then you need to introduce them to alternative ways of making a living that's not criminal. That's what you have to do. I appreciate this conversation for that very reason. And I'm just yeah. going to point out that um, I agree with what everyone is saying in terms of the higher education trade school and looking for ways to make a, a living, honestly, without going through that. I think it's important to remember where our focus is and where our favor comes from as well. And I'm speaking from experience, so I'm not speaking from anything I don't know because me, myself, I did go to college for a few years, but I did not graduate from a four-year university. I ended up going and getting a, a, an associate's degree at a trade school. And thank God he has shown favor to me in terms of the positions that I've been able to um, hold on to and just working up. And I think with a lot of children and young adults are misled is thinking that you have to have a four-year degree. Many of them go into debt, do not use those degrees, and find themselves um, making less than they set out to make or not able to live the life that they would like to to take care of their families. I think it is very important as parents and as Black people as well that we teach our children that there are other options, that there are ways to make yourself um, marketable in order to take care of your family and do what God has in our plan to do. And that does not always mean a four-year degree. So to look and give um, our, our children true other options versus pushing something down their throat. And, and again, I'm speaking from experience, so I understand that everybody may not agree with me, but that was the path that I ended up taking. And it, it and it's like you said, Mr. Robinson, from what we are taught, because my parents did not go to uh, four-year universities either, but they were all business owners. So the examples I had were my parents, my dad in HVAC had his own business. My mom was a real estate agent and, you know, was able to help support the family and do things on her own. Regina's a business owner. And these are people that were thankfully in my path to let me know I didn't have to put myself in a situation where I was financially strapped, but I was able to do the things, get the um, pay attention, grow, get the experience to be marketable and be able to get in those positions that God has been, blessed me to be able to walk into. And that's good because that, that everything you said is so true. And, you know, I don't think anybody disagree with you because, you know, black people can become the modern day elite through trade schools and colleges, but trade schools, I mean, you you can make quite a bit of uh, money being a plumber or electrician or a <laughs> or a roofer or uh, putting on siding or whatever you whatever trade you decide to take in welder whatever you decide decide to do your hard work will earn you quite a bit and. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say, go ahead. Like the guy uh, had her hand up. Oh, I know. I guess put my hand up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Time is running short, so I guess we might as well get ready to close this one out. But I appreciate you guys for listening and questions and comments. I appreciate that. I like I like the Q and A. And uh, I like the interaction. So thank you guys for coming in out tonight for this. Thank you, Mr. We thank you, well, we th we thank thank you for your information. Thank you, mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, guys. It's always enlightening. <laughs> always. Mm -hmm. yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you. You're going to praise our Regina. Regina. Thanks, Brother Robinson. Hey, you're welcome. 
Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just love you. We thank you and we honor you. We thank you what we have received tonight, oh God, a wealth of knowledge once again, oh God, from Brother Robinson, oh God. We ask that you continue to grow us in our communities, to grow us in our spiritual walk with you, oh God. But most importantly, oh God, we want to draw closer to you so that whatever purpose that we have, our children have, our children's children have, it can be revealed to us. We can discern it, oh God, and we can walk in that. We love you. We thank you and we honor you. In the blessed name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Good Amen. night. Amen. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank yep. you. Amen.